listening to music in the headphones. It's about to stop. Ten seconds. Go on, Tony. Go on, Tony. No, Mrs. May got into trouble for that. <laughs> I was only ever. I was only ever. <laughs> we are standing here um, in the middle of the Aviation and Military <coughs> Museum and um, dancing with um, former Chief Minister Tony Brown. If, now, this doesn't work well on radio, but it is now on Facebook Live. So. Yeah, it's one of those silent disco moments, and uh, we were enjoying ourselves. Tony, I'm not sure you knew what was going on. Well, mine was a non-movement disco. <laughs> I stood still. <laughs> Now we've moved to the section of the museum that's uh, more um, orientated, or oriented, I'll get it the right phrase one day, um, around the aviation side rather than the, the military side. And I'm just about to interview and your phone goes off. Who is this? Any they're clearly not listening. Mother in law. Oh, crikey, I'll turn it off quick. Um, Tony, we wanted to talk about. It can be Tony's phone off. Have I got a clue what he's doing? There we go. Um, before we start talk about the aviation, this is going so well, and before we talk about the aviation <laughs> side of things, um, we noticed that um, the, you know, we're all wearing different variations of uh, the, the poppy insignia. You have a very unique badge that you're wearing. Yes, this is one from the Scouts, so Scouts wear this, and I'm linked to the Scouts because in Castletown um, I'm on a committee that sort of helps uh, raise awareness and raise funds for the third Castletown Scouts. And um, you're talking about Castletown. Let's talk about you know, your memories and connections with Castletown. First of all, let's go back to the, the military connections. Now, there, there's a lot of history involved in Castletown when it comes to the links, met, and, and a lot of them with the Second World War. We all talk about the internment mm. camps in Douglas and the radar training stations in Douglas and RAF Jerby and places like this. Castletown's history. Well, Castletown and the surroundings, as it were, because these places were in Maloo. Um, we had, for example, a top secret radar station out at Scarlet, and you can still see the buildings there. And in fact, the guardhouse is still there. Um, and of course, where Castle Russian High School is now built, that used to also be a base, a military base. Janet's Corner was a military base. Um, where Military's garage was used to be the NAFI for Janet's Corner. Um, and of course, we had then Ronsway Airport, which was again just outside Castletown. But from our but they were all important, um, so the military. Uh, installations and played a big part in the war. Do you know what always fascinates me is that when we're talking about the Second World War now, 1939 to 1945, six years, a relatively short amount of mm. time, but the impact was just huge. Oh yes, because I mean, I think from what I know from the history, and I'm, I wasn't born during the Second World War, but based on the uh, information that you hear and the documentaries you see, of course, what it did do was very much bring the war to the country because of course there was mass bombing, there's the blitz all over the place, there were places like Liverpool, Belfast, Wales, um, London all bombed very badly, Coventry. So I think it brought a different style of war actually directly to the people. So whilst their husbands or sons were out fighting a war on Europe's uh, mainland, um, Britain was being bombed. So I think it had a different impact and I certainly remember when I was a young child, my mother and neighbours talking about the war, which I thought was a long, long way away, but in fact it was only 10 years away um, from when it ended. And when they were talking about it, they would talk about what the island was like, what Castletown was like, how you know the place was actually very, very busy. Uh, there were lots of people living here. There were people, of course, all the military bases. Um, there were people stationed to live in houses in the town, and they had no choice. They had to take people in. And, of course, their own people were out fighting the war, in Europe. So, you know, there was very much a feeling about what went on. The biggest issue, I suppose, for our generation is actually relating to that. Um, we can relate to the history, we can watch documentaries, but thank goodness we never actually experienced it. But that in itself creates a little bit of a difficulty to sometimes relate to it unless you've got family who were directly linked to it anyway. And that's a difficulty now, isn't it? Because I'm sure for you as well as me, Alex, we spoke to our grandparents about mm -hmm. it. But for the younger generations, they have no direct relative who was involved. And then it just becomes that much more difficult keeping the memories alive. And you're organising a remembrance concert, which is happening at Victoria Road School this Friday. And you mentioned that the pupils there are going to be taking mm -hmm. part. I mean, just how much do they understand of the significance of war, do you think? Well, I think it's difficult to know if what they understand about it. Um, I think what's important is that they, again, remember, like we all do, um, so we mark the occasion, we mark that people sacrificed um, their lives on our behalf, and I think that's important for us not to forget. Um, but I think the young children, what it does, it makes them think about it. So, for example, at Victoria Road School, they'll make a poppy display and they'll make it from bits of paper. 
um, they will learn poems, they will learn songs from the wars. And, you know, as they grow up, you know, some of them will remember that. And if they don't remember the detail, as we all do as children, you vaguely remember being involved in something that linked back to a period, i.e. remembering the war. So we think it's important in Castletown to get as many people from our community, children, parents, everybody, to just at least acknowledge and support what we're trying to do and raise money for the Poppy Appeal, which of course supports veterans and people who need support. And uh, it, it is successful in that way. It brings together families to actually uh, listen to what went on, albeit in a very short time, about an hour and a half concert. So, um, But I think the important thing for the young children is that they're actually involved in it, they're thinking about it, they're learning about it as they move on. Do you think that as we move on to the next generation and the generation beyond that, that the job of making people um, remember um, what happened during the war and the sacrifices that were made are going to be more difficult because that generation is almost desensitised by um, war films and modern media that you can watch a war film and you, you're detached from it because it's a film. And mm -hmm. because they've got no direct contact with people who lived through the reality of things like that, it's almost something that they can't relate to. I think it's difficult to be absolutely sure. I think it depends on what happens in the world, you know, over you know, the next sort of 50 years or whatever. But I mean, if you think about um, the wars that have been going on in Afghanistan and so on, I mean, the longest war America's been in, and yet there's less impact, seemingly, on society about that war. And the British have been involved, the French, all sorts of nations. And yet it's very much, uh, it's there, but it doesn't have a massive impact because uh, the impact individually on communities have been very small, even you know throughout the British Isles. Um, the world wars were different because the impact was so great, and I think the First World War, if you look at its history, was such a massive impact because, of course, apart from battles like um, Trafalgar and um, you know Wellington in the battle there, I mean, the the impact wasn't so great. But what the First World War did was it actually involved everybody. And of course, conscription was, in, was introduced in 1916, very controversially throughout the British Isles, including the Isle of Man. And of course, people, whether they wanted to go and fight for the country, had to go and fight for the country. So I think that in itself had a spin-off that maybe wasn't expected. Uh, and I think there'll always be um, some form of active remembrance. As things move on, it's whether that develops into something, you know, a bit further or nearer to them from what the First World War and Second World War have been. doesn't mean they'll forget it, but it's, it's sort of going so far away. I mean, there's nobody left alive now who was actually um, fighting in the First World War. There's very few left alive now who fought in the Second World War. Uh, and as time moves on, that will, you know, become a, an issue. Families will remember because it was their grandfather or it was their father or it was their uncle. And, and they have a different way to relate to it. Um, but where that isn't the case, I think that's going to be harder. Uh, but I don't think society will forget. I think society will continue to remember. It's how they remember, I think, is going to be the issue. Now, on a, on a slightly lighter note, we're talking about how we remember. We're here at the, <laughs> uh, the Aviation um, and Military Museum, focusing on the aviation bit for a moment. Um, it's next to Rodsway Airport. Now, I'm going to sound like, oh, in my day, I remember this airport when it was a lot smaller. Um, your memories of the development of this area from a point of view of aviation and the airport Things have changed dramatically, haven't they? Oh, they have. I mean, when I was a child, we used to come up the airport because there was something to do, believe it or not, <laughs> on a Sunday afternoon because there was absolutely nothing to do. We didn't have televisions. We didn't have... Oh, well, if we had telly, it was very poor in reception. Um, we didn't have computers. We didn't have iPads or anything like that, so we had to make our own phone. One of the things we used to do when we were sort of teenagers was go up to the airport, go upstairs into the cafe there, and we could watch the planes coming in and out. And uh, there was also a unique, at one time, um, little moulded plastic black and white television in a white chair and you used to put a shilling in and you could watch television for about, I think, five minutes. And that was wonderful because lots of people didn't have television, so they actually could go and do this up there. So that was some of our fun, if you like. Things have changed dramatically, security's changed dramatically. I mean, you used to walk in the front door at the airport and go across to the... Uh, to the counter where the lady was and you give her your ticket for the flight and then walk out the door beside and go on the plane. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, Ronsway's original airport when it was built was built for a million passengers. But that was with limited security, in fact, virtually no security. And that's why it was okay. As security developed, and I was fortunate enough to be Minister of um, the Department of Transport, as it was then, we extended the airport to what it is today, which can cater for about 750,000 people. 
So, you know, it, it just shows how much of an impact security and the change in the world has had on how we now travel. It used to be like, get on board a bus, didn't it, Beth? It really did. And even I sort of remember that. And it wasn't so far in the dim and distant past. But let's go and have a look over here, because this is one of, um, outside of all the, the war displays, one of my favourite displays down here at the Aviation and Military Museum. And this is the Manx Airlines display. And uh, here you can see uh, some of the outfits that would have been worn from Manx Airlines. Um, and just a real blast from the past there. It, it is. Uh, the, uh, you don't see uniforms like that on board the aircraft anymore, quite frankly. I just do remember that um, in the days of Manx Airlines, when you had um, the, the teaspoon that had Manx Airlines on it, you also had um, the, the infamous jet, the Isle of Man jumbo jet, Jemima, as, uh, as she used to be known because of her, her registration number on the end, um, and all the three legs that were up the sides. Mm, those are the good old days. But if you want a bit of a uh, sort of nostalgia, you can check that out at the Aviation Museum. And quite frankly, I just remember walking into the airport, and there was always the shop before you went into the cafe bar that used to sell the uh, the seaweed crisps, kelp crunches. Oh, I don't remember. remember that at all. I just remember sitting um, in the sort of waiting area and didn't, you know, now you go up the stairs, obviously, to departures through security, but that, wasn't that, there a that door? Was, that was the bit that Tony had built. Yeah. yeah. Bit, yeah. Wasn't there a, didn't you just sort of sit in the, you sort of went straight